Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Our webinar today is entitled Women, Menopause, Insulin Resistance, and Alzheimer. What is the link? Our guest speaker is Dr. Filomena Trindade. My name is Lenore Powell. I'm a medical education specialist in Genova's Atlanta branch. I'm going to serve as your moderator for today's webinar. We would like to welcome Dr. Filomena Trindade. She is a teacher, an author, and an international sought after lecturer in functional medicine. She is faculty at the Fellowship Master's Program in Metabolic Medicine at Metabolic Medical Institute, MMI. In addition, she is also faculty at the Institute for Functional Medicine, IFM. After obtaining her BA degree in biology, she went on to finish a master's in public health in the area of environmental health and epidemiology before starting medical school. She graduated first in her class in family practice from the University of California, Davis School of Medicine, and did her residency training in family practice at the UC San Francisco Santa Rosa program. She has been in clinical practice for over 22 years. Before starting her own private practice in 2004, in functional medicine, she was the medical director of a nonprofit organization that catered to the underserved. Her work has been published in Townsend Letter, Guide to Anti Aging and Regenerative Medicine, Ciudad Actual, and the Border Health Journal. She is currently very active in developing teaching programs in functional medicine in the US, Latin America, and Europe. More recently, Dr. Trindade developed a certification program called the Sayudad Hormonal Symphony, which teaches her approach to hormone balancing. To keep up with all of her activities or register for her certification program, you can always visit her website, www.drtrindade.com. That is www.drtrindade.com. The presentation and slide deck are going to be available on our website within a few days of the webinar. You can access these resources, previous webinar recordings, free video modules, and other materials by clicking the clinician's tab on the home page. I'm going to unmute and pass over the role of presenter to Dr. Trindade. Thanks, Lenore, and welcome everyone. So before I start most of my presentations, I usually like to have a picture that either calms me down or really helps figure out sort of how can I balance my right brain and my left brain. So this is a picture from my island that really helps me do that because as most of you already know, really can only maintain sort of um, brain function and really listening and learning for about 20 minutes at a time. So this webinar is 45 minutes plus questions, total of one hour. So I'm hoping that by throwing some of these pictures that um, are very soothing to me, and hopefully you'll find them soothing as well, that we can sort of help balance that right brain, left brain connection, because we'll be very left brain until then. So my objectives is really to try and uh, begin with just a little bit of a, of a understanding of the pathophysiology of mild cognitive decline and Alzheimer's and how it really relates to insulin resistance, diabetes type three, with particular attention to the woman in the menopausal transition. And then we'll review a little bit about the mechanisms of how diabetes contributes to Alzheimer's, particularly diabetes type two in women, and also um, identify some of the hallmarks of hormone replacement with respect to Alzheimer's um, disease in women. Now, as you all know, the incidence of Alzheimer's in women rises drastically at menopause in comparison to men and continues to progress rather rapidly. And we know that when you look at PET scans of a woman's brain, there's a big difference between a premenopausal brain and a postmenopausal woman. This is from the work of Dr. Moscone. And on this slide, what you see is that the color reflects sort of the brain activity scale so that the brighter colors indicate more activity, as you see on the left, and darker colors indicate lower activity. So the scan on the right is a menopausal woman's, a postmenopausal woman's brain, and the areas look greener and overall darker, which means that the woman's brain has substantially lower brain activity. Actually, it's about 30% less 
than the one on the left, which has no signs of menopause. Dr. Matt Moscone has published um, extensively in this area, and this is a study that where she talks about the sex difference and Alzheimer's risk and exactly what we just saw in that slide, in the previous slide. And so she demonstrated that in early midlife, women outperform men if they're age matched across all memory measures, but sex differences become attenuated for postmenopausal women. Although initial memory and, uh, and learning, um, sorry, memory retrieval and learning were particularly vulnerable, whereas memory consolidation and storage seem to be more preserved. So to me, this really points to the difference of what happens to a women's brain or the importance of ovarian decline, particularly estradiol production, as this slide really points out, and how it really shapes memory function. Other, many other authors have published on this area. Um, this is a work by uh, Christensen et al., uh, who mentions that the onset of menopause in midlife elevates the vulnerability of women for to Alzheimer's disease, and that that increased risk is highly associated with a depletion of estrogens. Now we know that menopause is also linked with many additional changes, including inflammation, increased central adiposity, increased risk for insulin resistance. And what I really liked about this um, article in particular is that it sort of had a, a functional approach, if you will, um, even though they didn't talk about functional medicine, in trying to explain how Al Alzheimer's is really a multifactorial disorder in which multiple risk factors interact with each other and really sort of regulate the pathogenesis of disease. I would add just a little bit, though, to this slide because it talks about menopause being associated with increased adiposity, which leads to insulin resistance, which, of course, we know can lead to type 2 diabetes. But I would also make that error a two way arrow. I would say that insulin resistance increases adiposity as well. And that together with you know, the menopausal transition and the increase in inflammation actually leads to the cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. So that adiposity does that, but we also need to look at insulin resistance then leading to menopause. I'm sorry, leading to the adiposity, which adds on when you go through menopause. Now, the nice thing about this is that they really were trying to tie all this to the loss of estrogens and uh, the, the increase in inflammation in women in menopause and how the loss of estrogens also increases central adiposity. And so that's what they were trying to, to explain there. But I would say that insulin resistance then can lead to um, adiposity. And when you're in the menopausal transition, women as women, we are much more susceptible. And I'll go through that in just a little while. And a little bit more detail, but in a slightly different approach. Now, we have had um, quite a bit of information about insulin resistance and your Alzheimer's risk, and so your diabetes type 3. Um, this is a, a paper that, for me, was extremely important because it really talked about how brain insulin resistance appeared to be an early and common feature of Alzheimer's disease, which was accompanied by IGF-1 resistance and also associated with the insulin receptor substrate 1 dysfunction. So then we're starting to see a little bit of an explanation as to, you know, what is the link that I mentioned in terms of insulin resistance, Alzheimer's disease, in particular in women in the menopause. This study was actually talking about how diabetes type 2 might be a risk factor for mild cognitive decline progressing to Alzheimer's disease. And we've had quite a few different researchers working on this topic. Uh, this is by Dr. De La Monte, and she says, we conclude that the term type 3 diabetes accurately reflects the fact that Alzheimer's disease represents a form of diabetes that selectively involves the brain and has molecular and biochemical features that overlap with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So again, a little bit more in trying to explain, you know, what is that link? Dr. Middle, though, uh, in this study, I think really tried to show exactly how does that work? What is sort of the underlying mechanisms? Because I find that it's much easier for me to understand and then in turn explain to my patients and help them understand um, what the process is. If I can get to that underlying root cause, if I can sort of understand the why, if I can figure out how, the why and how, in other words, how does this come to be? I think it's much easier 
for me to sort of understand it and have it in set in my brain as a picture because I'm a visual person, but also to then be able to um, help patients understand it. Because to me, a well-educated patient is a compliant patient. They can really understand the why. They're much more likely, I think, to uh, adhere to all the different recommendations that we're making. So Dr. Middle here talks about diabetes type 3 being a neuroendocrine disorder that represents sort of the progression of diabetes type 2 to Alzheimer's disease. Now, I really like this study in particular because he really tried to explain in this schematic, for example, of how these different protein interactions involved in type 2 diabetes then induced Alzheimer's disease. And he really shows how these um, different there's different hypotheses of the progression to type 3 diabetes, but the important thing to me is that it was sort of the first study that helped me really truly understand. There's others there, but this is the one that really sort of stands out for me that helped me understand the mechanism in which uh, insulin and beta amyloid are linked. And what he says is that it's really about this interaction of selective proteins from sort of this network that then can lead to type 3 diabetes. And what he says is that, you know, there are many mutated proteins, and that's what he represents here in red, and that that's how these mutated proteins can um, then be differentially expressed, and then that links type 2 diabetes to Alzheimer's disease. But one further aspect of the study is that he, I thought, did a really good job of trying to sort of explain this disturbed metabolic process um, that you see in type 3 diabetes. So he talks about the, the changes in glucose homeostasis, the disturbed cell survival, the perturbations in lipid metabolism, as well as enhanced apoptosis, and all the different pathways that are involved in that. So to me, this really sort of helped figure out that underlying mechanism. So let's take a nice deep breath and look at one of my sites that I really like doing my um, hikes because you have the ocean on one side and then you have the beautiful mountains on the other. And then let's then move on to really looking at, well, what about menopause? You know, what happens with menopause and dementia risk? And we've had very controversial studies. This is one of the reasons why I included um, this particular one here, because this points out, or the conclusion here points out just how big that controversy has been and what still I think is in many patients as well as some providers' minds in terms of you know, what exactly happens between the female hormones and dementia risk and how are they related. And up until about 2014, 2015, most of the studies actually had similar conclusions. But in the last four to five years, things have really changed. So I quote, existing evidence does not support an association between indices of prolonged exposure to female hormones and lower dementia risk. There are indications, however, for better cognitive performance and delayed cognitive decline, supporting a link between female hormone deficiency and cognitive aging. But it was still pretty controversial in terms of do uh, or does hormone replacement therapy really help um, in terms of decreasing someone's risk of cognitive decline in Alzheimer's. This study really points to some of the problems with the previous studies, and we've had even later studies that again support that, which is, now on, in this study, for example, it says these were the findings of nine randomized clinical trials of estrogen-containing hormone therapy in Alzheimer's disease, and it suggested that hormone therapy did not improve cognitive symptoms of women with Alzheimer's disease. Now, these were nine randomized clinical trials. If you go through all of those clinical trials and you separate out the ones where they were using transdermal hormone replacement for estrogen and they were using progesterone, either oral or transdermal, although most of them were transdermal, and not progestin, which becomes difficult sometimes when you're looking at a study because in many cases they'll say progestogen. If it says progestogen, you have to look further because you don't know if it was a synthetic progestin or if it was a bioidentical progesterone. In any case, if you look at the, those that we used bioidentical hormone therapy that was transdermal estrogen and either transdermal or oral progesterone, but it was progesterone, micronized progesterone, there were three of them. In those studies, the hormone therapy actually not only improved cognitive symptoms, 
but it really helps in the end decreasing the risk for Alzheimer's disease. So it's really important for us to look at how were those studies done and what conclusion do they come to? And especially if it's different, if it's a meta-analysis or if they're looking at reviewing different studies, that we really look at each individual study and look at the form of hormone replacement therapy. Now, more recent studies, such as the Wims Young or the Kronos Early Estrogen Prevention Study and the Early versus Late Intervention Trial with, with Estradiol that targeted younger women indeed show that hormone therapy may have a positive cognitive outcome in this age group. So again, it's really looking at what type of estrogen and how it's being used. Is it transdermal or is it oral? And is it a bioidentical or is it asynthetic? Another study, this is looking at role of estrogen and other sex hormones in brain aging, as well as neuroprotection and DNA repair. And it says sex hormones, particularly estrogens, possess potent antioxidant properties that play roles in maintaining normal reproductive and non-reproductive functions. But they also exert neuroprotective actions and their loss during aging and natural surgical menopause is associated with mitochondrial dysfunction, neuroinflammation, synaptic decline, cognitive impairment, as well as increased risk of age-related disorders. Moreover, loss of sex hormones has been suggested to promote an accelerated aging phenotype, eventually leading to the development of brain hypometabolism, which is commonly observed in menopausal women and prodromal Alzheimer's disease. And again, these are more recent studies in the last four to five years. Another study that really points to the possible reasons for these mixed data that I just mentioned to you. In other words, that in many cases, when you're looking at a group or a review of multiple studies, they used or they grouped those that were using oral, those that were using synthetic, as well as those, those that were using bioidentical, and they didn't separate out the difference between those that were using synthetic versus um, bioidentical hormone, as well as the root. So this study really looked at that and said, well, this points to the mixed reasons or the reasons for that mixed data, considering issues of both preclinical and clinical trials, and in particular, the re representativeness of animal models, timing of hormone therapy initiation, the type, so different types of estrogen compounds, just like I mentioned, also estrogen monotherapy versus estrogen progesterone combined therapy, as well as the mode of delivery, so subcutaneous, transdermal, oral, or intramuscular, and the hormone therapy used, as well as the heterogeneity of the postmenopausal population in clinical trials, particularly looking at their stage, as well as their stage of, of cognitive decline, as well as their anti Alzheimer's therapy, as well as their hysterectomy stats. So, pretty amazing stuff, right? Because this, when you really look at this, this really changes how we can approach and uh, what the mechanisms are in terms of cognitive decline and hormones. This is looking at um, neurodegenerative uh, disease management in general. In particular, they say recent advances in menopause hormone therapy, including transdermal estrogen therapy, have favorably influenced the balance of benefits and risk. A case can be made for menopause hormone okay. therapy in the initial, I'm sorry, in healthy postmenopausal women for five to 10 years, starting during the menopausal transition, which they're calling sort of your window of opportunity. In other words, the earlier in the process of the perimenopausal period that you start, the better the outcome. And it says together with other protective measures, this will really help to delay or prevent the development of age-related cognitive decline in later life. Let's take another deep breath and look at a um, beautiful site. This is a picture of my neighboring island. Uh, which I really love waking up and looking at it almost every day that I can while I'm there. So then when we put all this together, we looked at insulin resistance being diabetes type 3, and what happens in terms of estrogen and cognitive decline in women. How do we put all this together, and then how do we use it to really approach our patients? Because over and over again in the more recent studies, they've really pointed to the optimal window of opportunity for a therapeutic intervention in women really being early in that endocrine aging process. But we also know that no two women are the same, and we are practicing personalized medicine. So it's extremely important 
that we personalize our approach. We take sort of everything that we have learned, but we really are going to then personalize it to that one patient. And I always have patients that come to me from referrals from other patients and they'll say, oh, I know what you did with my friend. So I'm prepared and um, I know what she's doing. I know we're going to do the same thing. And my answer is we may order the same tests. You know, I may be doing the same exam in terms of, you know, physical exam, but you are you. You are an individual. You're different. Although you may have the same hormones, their balance may be a little different. And the reasons why they're imbalanced may be a little different. So we have to really personalize it to you. And how exactly how do we do that? Right? How do we personalize our approach? If not women are the same, how can we individualize what we do? I believe this takes a few different steps. Number one, I think we have to realize that all these hormones interact with each other, right? There's these web-like interactions between them. And then some of them can have more downstream effects than others, right? And so we need to just keep that in mind. Plus, we also know that detecting individuals at risk within a healthy population is really critical for preventing or delaying Alzheimer's disease. In other words, we want to really start as early as we can because we know that there's this somewhat of a systems biology interaction of brain and body metabolism that is, is also going to help us in using biomarkers to service sort of our reporters, if you will, of what's going on with our brain or our bioenergetic status. So to me, we need to put all this together, but really look at hormones like a symphony, right? And just like in a symphony, you have a conductor, but you also have to have each instrument fine-tuned in and of itself. And all the instruments need to be working well together, right? They need to play beautiful music together in order for us to really enjoy what we're listening to. So you have to have each one fine-tuned. So each instrument, a conductor that conducts well, and then they all need to make beautiful music together. To me, so it is with our hormones. And this is why I came up with a Saudade Hormonal Symphony. And it's not just about looking at the hormones, but it's particularly important at looking at the order, the order in which you look at them. For example, I truly believe that we should be looking at insulin and treating insulin and looking for and diagnosing insulin resistance as early as possible. And I really feel that we need to look at that first because there are so many downstream effects, then adrenals, then thyroid. And it's possible that we may be looking at insulin and treating insulin resistance, uh, HPA axis dysfunction and thyroid at the same time. But really we wanna keep insulin first and foremost in our brain because it has so many downstream effects. And if we consider and we look at and balance insulin, HPA axis, and, and thyroid, by the time we get to the sex hormones in the perimenopausal women, many times they may have already be balanced. If they're not, then we're going to work on that. And we also really need to look at estrogen metabolism, not just because we're giving someone a hormone and we know that it, if we're doing it through the right route and the right form, it's not really what increases their risk per se, but the studies show it's how the woman metabolizes those hormones that increase her risk. So estrogen metabolism to me becomes key. Even in the woman that may not want hormone replacement, you still need to look at estrogen metabolism because that is what increases her risk for hormone related cancer. And then we're gonna look at, so we're gonna have our order, and then we're gonna look at well, what are the disruptors of hormonal function. And when you look at this, you can use this for almost any process. We're talking about now hormones and as it relates to the perimenopausal woman and her risk for Alzheimer's disease. But remember that this can be used for almost any, any disease process or any dysfunction your patients present with. So you're going to ask about trauma, particularly emotional trauma. What's going on with their sleep? Do they have an infection? You know, could this just be due to aging? We know that most hormones decrease with aging, except cortisol, which actually increases. But could this also be a result of some other inflammatory disease or single nucleotide polymorphism or different toxins? Or could it be a nutritional insufficiency or a food intolerance or changes in the gut microbiota or altered biotransformation? Or could this be a result of a pharmaceutical drug that the patient is either currently on or has been on previously? 
This is a list that I copyrighted. You can use it for almost any process that you are using with your patients. So we're gonna have sort of that background in mind, and then we're really gonna take a full history, right? We're gonna to listen to our patient because most likely she will be telling us what the diagnoses are. Some patients are a little more difficult to obtain, not just the chief complaint or the history of present illness, but what is their past medical history? What's their surgical history? What are their hobbies? You know, what have they sort of done to their life so far? What's their supplement and medication? And then we're also gonna do a very thorough physical exam which I don't have a lot of time to get into um, here, but I believe that that's really important. And then we're gonna order our labs. But in each case, we're gonna try and see, do our physical findings and match to what we see on laboratory evaluation? Because remember, our laboratory gives us reference ranges, but it's important for us to look for each individual patient and personalize their approach to where do they fall and what is the optimal range for them. So then we're gonna start with insulin. And why do I start with insulin? Well, because insulin has many downstream effects. It affects carbohydrate, lipid, metabolism. It can affect other hormones, particularly thyroid. It has direct effect on endothelial function. So it's a, to me, it is the upstream hormone because it's going to have a lot of downstream effects. And I feel that that's where we need to start particularly when we're living in an era where we have a lot of undiagnosed insulin resistance, and that could be contributing to the hormonal dysfunction that we see in our patients. This is a study looking at menopausal complaints being associated with increased cardiovascular risk factors. So in other words, women with, with more menopausal complaints, so more hot flashes, more night sweats, more mood changes, we know that they're associated with a higher cardiovascular risk profile. However, for a long time, we did not know why. More recent studies have showed us why. It's just because those women tend to be more insulin resistant. So hot flashes were associated with a higher HOMA index, which is an estimate of insulin resistance, and to a lesser extent, higher glucose. So this has really helped us to try and figure out how these metabolic factors can be relevant to looking at someone's risk and that women with more menopausal symptoms have more cardiovascular risk due to insulin. In other words, due to being insulin resistant in some cases, you know, further along that continuum, hyperglucose tolerant or pre-diabetic. This is another study looking at vasomotor symptoms being associated with insulin resistance. And again, this was measured by the home IR over a period of approximately eight years. And the, I really liked what they concluded, which is that these findings may contribute to ongoing efforts to better understand any mechanisms linking hot flashes to cardiovascular health. Because as women, when we go through menopause, our cardiovascular risk actually increases and it's higher than men's. But I feel like that hasn't really been sort of um, really emphasized in women. And also too, we present very atypically when we have, uh, when we're presenting with an acute cardiovascular problem. This is another study looking at uh, vasomotor symptoms and showing that in postmenopausal women, they're associated with increased insulin resistance. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go through treatment, but I wanna just mention a few things because I have my rule of threes for my dietary management of the patient with insulin resistance, which is decrease insulin stimulation, modify the gut microbiota, and you're also going to improve your insulin resistance or your um, cellular responsiveness to insulin. And so just to back up here for a minute, with decreasing insulin stimulation, we're really talking about dietary modification. So increasing our green leafy vegetables, increasing vegetables in general, 10 to 12 servings, really under making our patients understand the difference between the good and the bad carbs, but also doing an elimination diet and eliminating the most inflammatory foods. And while we're doing that, we are working with a gut microbiota, but I want to make sure that we work with it even a little bit further in terms of increasing fermented foods, as well as making sure that we're taking 35 to 50 grams of fiber. And I like to see 35 grams of fiber that is not due to vegetables, but it's mostly nuts and seeds. And then we also need to look at probiotics and prebiotics. With increasing uh, the cellular responsiveness to insulin, we're still talking about certain foods, especially herbs and spices, but also all our nutraceuticals. Now, this is a study looking at Alzheimer's disease as the potential type 3 diabetes and that the potential for restoring brain insulin levels or glucose and energy metabolism via the administration of either intranasal insulin and ketogenic diets. This is a study that was really looking at the fact that we, it's 
it, that we have many a variety of diets available, and it's just here to remind me to mention that, that the Mediterranean diet is the diet that is probably most well studied in terms of treating insulin resistance, but we also have the ketogenic diet. I feel like with the ketogenic diet, we need to make sure we're preparing our patients uh, to go into ketosis, because as you go into ketosis, you're gonna liberate a lot of toxins and need to make sure that our patients are ready to handle that. So moving on to second part of the Saldade Hormonal Symphony, the adrenals, or rather the HPA axis. Now we know the cortisol and the HEA are derived from the same precursors and that we're seeing women present in the perimenopause earlier and earlier. And I think a lot of it's due to the stress and the stress that we're under, all the multitasking, get it done yesterday, um, which makes women sort of shift. And we used to call this the cortisol steel, the prenatal steel. It's really a shift to the glucocorticoid pathway. And when we're looking at the adrenals, we really need to look at Hanselier's general adaptation syndrome. I think that really helps us figure out sort of what is going on with that patient, but also how do we approach it? And so he said there's basically three stages. Stage one is arousal, stage two is adaptation, and really stage three, if you continue on that, is exhaustion. But we know that it's not just about the adrenal. So it's not that the adrenal becomes fatigued, it's rather what is going on with the HPA axis and why has sort of the brain in a sense shut down adrenal function. And in many cases, it can be for self-protection, it could be a down-regulation of receptors. It's controversial um, exactly why, but we have several different possibilities that are being discussed. And then with respect to treatment, you also wanna treat based on what stage. So in stage one, cortisol is high, DHEA may be high or normal. In stage two or the adaptation phase, cortisol is still high, but DHEA starts to decline. And in stage three, both DHEA and cortisol are low. But we need to figure out how to bring balance back with the HPA axis. And we, of course, we start with diet that is our um, sort of your foundation, but so are lifestyle changes. And lifestyle factors are extremely important, as well as adaptations, and we can also use hormone replacement. Now moving on to thyroid. The most important thing with thyroid is to realize sort of exactly what happens because we know, for example, that TIH acts on the pituitary to release TSH, which acts on the thyroid gland to produce mostly T4, right? Approximately 95% T4, which then needs to be converted to T3 in the kidney or the liver. So really the thyroid gland only makes about 5% T3, but the active hormone is the free T3. It's not the T4, it's a T3. So we need to make sure that that conversion is happening. And that in order for T4 to be converted into T3, um, it's a five prime deodinase that is selenium dependent. It has a lot of other cofactors, including hormones, as well as minerals and other vitamins. But the selenium um, is extremely important because that enzyme is selenium dependent. And we know that particularly when we're under stress, Instead of T4 being converted into T3, it can be converted to reverse T3, which is the inactive form of the hormone. So it's really important that when we are looking at measuring, you know, looking at our measures of thyroid function, that we're looking at TSH, free T3, free T4, as well as our reverse T3 and TPO, as well as antithyroglobal antibodies. And really try and figure out why do we see changes in thyroid function. And particularly, we want to look upstream and see what has happened with the adrenals, because the adrenals can affect what we see in terms of our thyroid function. This is why I look at insulin first, adrenals, and then thyroid before going on to the sex hormones. Because in many cases, particularly in the perimenopause, if we've addressed the insulin as well as the HPA axis and thyroid, in many cases, our patients may now be balanced. If they're not, then we're going to go on and look at what's going on with their sex hormones. Now here, it's really important that we look at what hormones do we lose first? For example, I think that in many cases, particularly my patients that come in, they think about estrogen. They don't necessarily think about estrogen um, as well as progesterone and testosterone. But the fact is that in the perimenopause, we tend to lose our progesterone first. And as I had showed earlier, in terms of the cortisol diversion, or it's been called the prenatal steel, we can see how when we're stressed, 
it will be the precursors of the steroidogenic pathway will be diverted to the glucocorticoid pathway. And we are dependent on the adrenals for progesterone production in the first 14 days of our cycle or the follicular phase. So you can start to see how that can affect a woman. And if we're particularly in stress, in a stressful mode, we're going to be diverting those precursors down into the corticoid pathway. But we also need to remember uh, that many women may lose their testosterone at the same time as a progesterone or even a little bit sooner. So we want to make sure that we're looking at estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. And whenever we talk about hormone replacement, we can't talk about it without looking at breast cancer risks. But we have several studies, right? We have the French study, the initial study, which was over 50,000 women. This is the follow-up study, or what's been called the E3 cohort study, which in the follow-up was 80,377 postmenopausal women that, where we found that when combined with an estrogen, a progesterone had a better risk profile in the breast compared with other progesterogens. So progesterone, looking at bioidentical progesterone, whereas when uh, we say progestogen, in many cases, we're talking about a progestin, but you don't know when they say the when they use the word progestogen, because it could either be progesterone or it can be progestin or methoxyprogesterone acetate. So you need to look further into those studies. This is looking at co-administration of conjugated equine estrogens and either um, methoxyprogesterone acetate, so a synthetic progestin, or micronized progesterone, causing differential effects on memory in postmenopausal women. And we actually have um, several studies looking at this. So in other words, the women who had the micronized progesterone had better effects on memory than those that were using the synthetic progestin. Now, this study I found really important because we often wonder, what about women that are sort of your poor metabolic women? Um, you know, can we still use hormone replacement in them? And are we putting them at increased risk? And what it showed was that compared with healthy women, poor metabolic women had significantly lower executive, global, and cognitive memory performance, but hormone therapy provided metabolic benefit to women, even though they had high blood pressure and they were poor metabolic phenotype, meaning that many of them had metabolic syndrome, for example. Now, if you use my approach, my cell death hormonal symphony, in those women, you would have already addressed the insulin resistance, and you've been working on that. So you're, in a sense, would be changing their metabolic phenotype. But it's really nice to have studies that show that this is safe, even in women who would, have, who would be your sort of poor metabolic phenotype. And this is a study. Um, their graph sort of looking at menopausal women that um, were poor um, metabolic phenotypes versus those that were not in their scores. Now, can, is memory always lost with menopause? You know, I really believe that that's not necessarily the case, you know, as this researcher points out. It's possible that the timing of the start of the hormone replacement therapy exactly to the menopause, or I would say early in the perimenopause process, could really provide the best benefit of memory and inflammation processing. You know, they're talking about, in this study, looking at the start of hormone replacement therapy exactly to the menopause, but I say we really need to be addressing the women in the perimenopausal period. Anytime that they're presenting with symptoms, you know that there's a hormonal imbalance, and we need to be fixing those as soon as we can. This is um, looking at Alzheimer's disease in the postmenopausal women and how intervention is critical, and they're talking about the use of 17 beta estradiol in young and healthy postmenopausal women really yielding the maximum benefit when the neurons are still intact or neuronal stress has just started, and I'm quoting. Hence, intervention in the critical period is key in the prevention and delay of Alzheimer's disease in postmenopausal women. But of course, everybody listening here is going to be looking at those hormonal interactions as well as imbalances early on in the process. Now that one takes me to estrogen metabolism. I could spend hours talking about estrogen metabolism and its importance because we have so many studies looking at how important this is in assessing someone's risk. With women, any hormone-related cancer, of course we always think about breast cancer, but other hormone, hormonally-related cancers, and in men, also looking at prostate cancer, for example, as well as their risk for lymphoma that's associated with how they metabolize their hormones. But or rather their single nucleotide polymorphisms. 
However, this has not been adopted into clinical practice um, at large. And I feel like this is a great area where we could really intervene and help our patients. So we're really looking at how are the estrogens metabolized and the fact that we have three possible pathways. I've called them the good and the bad and the ugly. I've heard other people refer to them the same way. So we're really talking about the two hydroxy pathway, the 16 hydroxy and the four hydroxy. But it's really important that we don't just look at what happens in phase one, but that we also look at what happens in phase two, which is our methylation, glutathione conjugation. It's basically all our conjugation reactions. So although this is genetically determined, and if you have a single nucleotide polymorphism in either CYP1A1 or the two hydroxy pathway, you have an upregulation of that pathway. So if you have a single nucleotide polymorphism in CYP3A4, you have an upregulation of the 16 hydroxyestrone. If you have an upregulation of the CYP1B1, that's the four pathway or the ugly. So the good being the two, the bad being the 16, and the ugly being the four. If you have an upregulation of that pathway, then that woman or man is using that pathway more. So it's an up or a SNP, and that pathway is an upregulation of that pathway. A single nucleotide polymorphism in phase two is a down regulation of that pathway, which is sort of opposite what we would like, because if you have an upregulation in phase one, you have more reactive intermediates. And so you need to have more suppressed to support in order to further process and eliminate, metabolize and eliminate those reactive intermediates. However, if you can you see if you have an upregulated phase one, let's say it's CYP1B1, so they're using more the bad or the ugly pathway, the worst pathway. Um, and then we have a down-regulated phase two where there's less methylation and less glutathione conjugation. That really puts that woman or that man at a much higher risk. And this, I believe we should be doing in every woman, particularly in those that we're starting on hormones because we wanna make sure we're not increasing the risk. But we also want to look at what their baseline risk is. And you can do estrogen metabolism. You can also do genomics. But with genomics, you need to follow up with your estrogen metabolism because you still want to see what is happening with that patient at every particular time. And especially you want to see that because although this is genetically determined, whether that or not they have a polymorphism in that area, and I feel like this may be one of the reasons why we haven't seen as good outcomes as we expected when we work on the 2 to 16 ratio, because we're only working on phase one. And we know that the two is only protective if it's methylated. So even though two being the good, it's considered, so the two is considered the good pathway, the two hydroxyestrone is only protective if it gets methylated to, to two methoxyestrone. But although I said, that whether you use the good, the bad, or the ugly pathway is genetically predetermined, there's a caveat to that. And that is that endocrine disruptors or your xenobiotics that can modify intercellular communication and function can actually change that. So even if you're not genetically sort of predetermined to use the four or the 16 pathway, if you have a lot of exposure to endocrine disruptors, they can actually modify members of the CYP450 uh, system or, or enzymes, and you can then see a higher ratio of the 4 and 16 hydroxylate estrogen derivatives that are more genotoxic, especially with the 4 that can lead to DNA addicts. So really, genomics in this case is not enough. We really need to be looking at estrogen metabolism. So even if you're doing genomics on your patients, and with, especially with respect to endocrine disruptors and their exposures, which in many cases, sometimes we don't know just how much they've been exposed to, even with a thorough history, you want to look at estrogen metabolism as well, because that can tell you exactly what pathway they're being utilized. So to me, it is really at looking at the whole hormonal symphony as a cell the hormonal symphony in terms of starting with insulin, looking at your HPA axis, your adrenals, thyroid, sex hormones, not forgetting about estrogen metabolism. Doing that, we can really create the beautiful music, um, whether you're listening to a symphony or you're dancing traditional dances. I feel like that's really the only way that we can sort of help our women and our men you know, make beautiful music together and dance. Of course, I love to dance. So I hope that this has been, been useful and um, we will take some questions.
before we get to the questions, Dr. Filomena, if you don't mind uh, scrolling forward one more slide and tell us a little bit more about the certification program, please. Thank you so much. See, I get so excited about talking that I forget. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you about two things. Um, I have a Soldata certification program. It's an online uh, program where we go through the Soldata Hormonal Symphony. And uh, we, you have a video one week, and then the following week is a live question and answer webinar, where I go through each week is each area of the Soldata Hormonal Symphony. So insulin, adrenals or HPA axis, thyroid, sex hormones, estrogen metabolism. And um, it's going on right now, but you can still sign up. It took me a long while to sort of get this up and running, and I'm really excited about it. And I'm also excited to hear um, how it's received because it's uh, constantly, we're always in this learning path and trying to improve and make things um, better and learn from them. And then I also have my retreats. I usually have two. I'll be doing one at the end of May, so May 30th to June 3rd. This is five days on my island. This is actually a picture of my island. And uh, I'll have another one in August. Now, this one in May is a little bit more emphasizing sort of the functional approach and what I do, but also really enjoying the amazing areas on the island, learning a little bit about the culture and really focusing on us too. How do we take care of ourselves as providers? So this one is, is a little bit more focused towards providers, although I've had both. And the one in August um, can be anyone. Um, it depends as, as the universe will have it. It always works out to be, you know, a really good group. I like keeping it small so we can do a lot of one-on-one -on -one and that uh, we have a lot of time for personal growth as well as professional growth. So I hope you join me. That is so wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and transition into the question and answer section of this webinar. So we did receive quite a few amazing questions here. Um, let's start with this one. Has there been found, have you found in literature a comparison between the use of implants or pellets, topical and oral hormonal replacement therapy with regard to benefits in cognition? Yes, most of the literature uh, is comparing oral. And when you can look at oral, you have to take some things into account that, uh, for example, some of these are, uh, they're not all, not all the studies are done in the US. And in other countries, there are um, certain oral um, hormone replacement that are not available in the U.S. Uh, Tibolone, for example, which is a drug that's been used quite a bit in Europe, it has uh, both estrogenic, progesteronic, as well as some testosterone action. So when you look at the studies, there's been divisions between transdermal and oral, not as much of implants. I'm just just starting to see that right now. But when you look at those that are oral and then you have to look at synthetic versus bioidentical, the best outcomes in terms of, of uh, cognition is the transdermal for estrogen and but the bioidentical progesterone being both oral or transdermal. Uh, they have studies on both. Amazing. Regarding patients who are hypoglycemic, versus patients who are hyperglycemic, how do we work with them to help improve cognitive benefits? Well, I think you have to start with the, in, the insulin resistance or rather the um, imbalance in insulin because at, and many times you see patients who are hypoglycemic because they are getting on sort of that continuum of insulin resistance, as I mentioned. So starting to me, starting with insulin is key because even if they have adrenal dysfunction and they're having periods of hypoglycemia or hyper and hypo both, um, if you really go upstream and you look at insulin, I mean, you still need to, to look at what's going on with the adrenals. That's really important as well. But if you really start with insulin, try to get to the underlying root cause, you're, it's gonna lead you to the adrenals anyway. But I feel like if you start with insulin and trying to figure out, you know, how can you um, decrease the insulin uh, stimulation and what can we do with the gut microbiota because it's a, a huge contribution. And then, you know, how can we increase the cellular responsiveness to insulin? If you do that, you can really balance out and eliminate those, the changes between hypo or hyper or someone who's doing both. You can really help them stabilize. And sometimes when you stabilize 
initially the blood sugar may be a little higher than you want or their insulin may be a little higher, but that's just for the time being until you really help the body regulate it. For dietary management of insulin resistance, can you elaborate a little bit more upon eliminating soy? So a lot of um, patients have sensitivities to different foods. And so you want to figure out what are those sensitivities. And the five most common ones are gluten, dairy, soy, corn, and nightshades, uh, nightshade vegetables, particularly your peppers, your tomato, eggplant, that sort of thing. So I find it easy to eliminate those five. Sometimes I may not eliminate um, nightshades depending on what their symptoms are like or if they don't have a lot of arthralgias or myalgias. Um, but it's really important that we eliminate all of those because they can lead to inflammation and they can also affect your um, insulin regulation. So I find it easy to eliminate those for at least four weeks, sometimes a little bit longer, and then you can reintroduce one at a time in a specific manner to see if that's contributing or causing any inflammation. You can also do your food sensitivities um, testing, but there's no perfect food sensitivity test out there, although there are some that I like. Um, I think that using an elimination diet, you get to see when you reintroduce, and reintroduction is key in the way you reintroduce, but when you do that, then you really get to see effects other than that, that may not be immune mediated that a patient can have. Is there a place or a role for using progesterone bioidentical replacement without estrogen, especially when thinking about patients who've had a partial or total hysterectomy? Well, it's all about balance. So, and when, when we go through menopause as women, um, we're dominant on one hormone. Most of us are dominant in and we're estrogen dominant in the perimenopause because we lose our progesterone first but it's all about measuring it's all about first of all listening to your patient seeing if you can figure it out just through their history and physical exam but also measuring to see you know if they're estrogen dominant because they may have had a hysterectomy, but they may still be estrogen dominant. They could be estrogen dominant because they're endohepatically recirculating their hormones. They could be estrogen dominant because they still have their ovaries intact. So it's all about balance. So if they're estrogen dominant and their progesterone is really low, they may only need progesterone. And I have a lot of those patients. The fact is, though, with those, you have to monitor them closely because eventually they, their estrogen may de is going to decrease. And so you want to make sure you're maintaining balance. But it's all about really figuring out what are they low in. Sometimes they'll lose their testosterone before their progesterone or their estrogen. And so they may only need replacement there. But it, it's all, it's really about figuring out where are they at. Because I have many patients that early on, their estrogen levels are high. They're symptomatic because they're not ovulating and they're not making progesterone. So they may just need progesterone for a short time. The question is, um, are you keeping up? Are you making sure that they're not becoming now imbalanced somewhere else or in another hormone? This is why I really feel like the, that my approach really helps me because then we're looking at all the different hormones and how they contribute and work together. You mentioned briefly dietary management for patients with insulin resistance. Can you please give some examples of spices or herbs? Absolutely. So Spices, cinnamon, there's a lot of literature on cinnamon, but really um, it can be any spice because clove has a really high ORAC value, especially if you're using like a clove essential oil, which you can just use a few drops in the food. You can add it to nuts, you can add it to their chai or their um, beverage, whatever beverage they're drinking. Um, cardamom, nutmeg, basically all the spices um, really work to help the um, insulin resistance. And, you know, you can also do the same thing with herbs. You know, some herbs have been studied, for example, are your basil, your thyme, your, um, um, what's that called, marjoram, um, main, rosemary, you know, there's wide references. So that I feel that the more we can use, the more we can add it to our diet, the more we're working towards decreasing inflammation and insulin resistance. Can you discuss a little bit about women who have high BMIs and that link to estrogen dominance? 
Great, because I kind of alluded to it, but I didn't um, go into detail. So we know that the um, adipocyte, so the fat cell, is a biologically active organ, and it makes hormones. And it particularly, it can make um, estrogen as well, mostly estrone. But it makes um, it makes a per it can make a person estrogen dominant just by having increased weight gain or being um, obese, overweight or obese. So it's really important that particularly in those women that we realize that they may be estrogen dominant. So we want to really look at how are they metabolizing their estrogens, but also how can we bring them back in balance? It's, uh, I look at it this way, you know, most women that are gynoid in shape will become a little bit android in the menopausal period or in the menopausal transition. And to me, that's sort of a way in which you can have more fat cells that are going to produce more estrogen. I think it's a, the body's way to try to compensate. But if we are identifying, diagnosing, and treating that transition earlier on, then we can avoid that. Because also, you know, when you have more fat cells, you're making more adipocytokines that are inflammatory. So you want to make sure that you're trying to um, decrease that as much as we can. All right. Regarding modifying the gut microbiota, can supplementing with butyrate also addressing food sources to help improve short-chain fatty acids in the microbiome, is that also going to help with improving insulin resistance? Yes, it will to a certain degree, but I think we need to look at sort of everything and how are you increasing butyrate? So butyrate is one of the short-chain fatty acids. Um, it's the one that provides fuel for the colonocytes. It's also one that whenever I measure it, I find it, you know, really low in most patients. Um, so I think it's really important that we give sources that can then, the body can then use, or the microbiota is we're going to use to make more butyrate. So you can use things like um, acacia fiber, which Dr. Perlmutter has promoted quite a bit. But you can also do use some things like um, your, um, many of the, the other fibers like uh, flaxseed, um, actually flaxseed meal, I should say, but um, especially chestnuts. So chestnuts can, um, when ingested, and you can do chestnut flour, but also the whole chestnut can then help the body produce more butyrate. So to me, it's important that we do the precursors, but then you can also add butyrate. So you can add butyrate to that to help, and you can do it orally. Um, there's actually some um, gastroenterologists that may use it as an enema, but I feel like in this case to help the gut microbiota, oral is good to start with the food that you know will do that. So you want to do a food source and then you can supplement with your butyrate, so um, nutraceutical. For phase one, you did mention inhibiting the bad and ugly pathways with foods and supplements, but what about phase two? How do we help to support those pathways regarding estrogen metabolization? Oh, thank you for asking that question, whoever did that, because I meant to say a little bit more about that, and I didn't. Um, I feel that we really should be starting with phase two and not with phase one when we're looking at estrogen metabolism, because it's really hard to tell just how toxic somebody is. I mean, you can look at different intermediates and you can get an idea, but I really feel like we're sort of walking around in a very toxic environment. And so as a consequence, we're toxic to some degree. And we really should be starting with methylation, glutathione conjugation, helping glucuronidation, but in particularly methylation and glutathione conjugation, because we know that those are the two pathways that are particularly important in phase two for estrogen metabolism. Glucuronidation is two, sulfation as well, but we know that methylation and glutathione conjugation is where we should start. It's not that we don't do the others. I think we need to be also looking at those, but those just are the, the key pathways. So we want to do things like um, increasing their magnesium, uh, because that's going to help with um, the methylation. It's actually COMT uses magnesium as a cofactor, catecholamine methyltransferase, that is. And then helping glutathione conjugation. We can add foods that are rich in glutathione, just like we can add our green leafy vegetables. We're going to have higher levels of folate and bioavailable folate, not the synthetic folic acid, for example. And in many cases, we know that there's single nucleotide polymorphisms where we may also need to add the activated Bs. But with respect to uh, glutathione, for example, you can e eat more asparagus and try to make it organic asparagus because it's very high in glutathione, avocados, uh, kiwi, for example, and then you add glutathione 
precursors to that. So your selenium, for example, all of your amino acids that help you make more glutathione, such as NAC, glutamine, glycine, and you can add sulforaphane also, for example, there's quite a few studies on that, and you can give the glutathione itself. But I feel like we should be doing a little bit of each to help our body bake more, but also give it the glutathione itself. And you can measure levels as well. Thank you. In the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and end our question and answer period right there. Amazing questions, amazing presentation, Dr. Philomena. Um, just for additional resources, education materials, we would like to encourage you all to visit our website at www.gdx.net. In addition, you can also go on that website to register for our upcoming webinar topics. Next month, we will have Dr. Pamela Smith presenting on um, a personalized approach to managing male hormones. And you can see several dynamic speakers to follow in the upcoming months, including Dr. Stephen Goldman, Dr. Ann Shippey, and Dr. Elizabeth Ford. Thank you again, Dr. Trindade, for a thank great you. presentation. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, and have a great day.